So I'm going to switch gears a little bit and talk about, in a holistic way, some of the things that you've heard a little bit about today, and then I'm going to talk about some of the specific genetic issues. Um, again, any of these materials, we're glad to give you the originals so that you can um, really focus if you want to be able to go back to them. Um, the important thing that I want to mention is that you've heard many different manifestations for VHL. I have never had a patient with VHL, and I've had many, many patients, um, but I've never had anyone who had every single manifestation of VHL. So it's a matter of different people have different manifestations. We don't always know uh, who's going to have what or when they're going to have it. Uh, but I don't want you to feel overwhelmed and think, oh my goodness, I'm a ticking time bomb. It's just a matter of, you know, when uh, all these different things are going to happen. Um, as I said, I, we do screening in a holistic way to make sure that we've screened for everything, but it's not as if all of the things are going to happen. In particular, and I'll just call out a couple things, the endolymphatic tumors that you heard Dr. Bruce talk about, those sort of things near the ears. Um, out of all of our over 100 patients with VHL here, we've had one patient who've had that particular tumor. It's important important, it can happen, and that's why we tell you guys to monitor any ringing in your ears, any hearing differences that you're noting, um, but it is something that we, you know, sort of lower down in our frequency list. And just so you know, that's, that's why it's lower down, because we've had enough experience uh, as a community to know what's more or less likely to happen. So this was, um, there was a question earlier in terms of, you know, how early do they, things happen? So I, uh, and I want to call out Alana Chilton, who's actually, uh, for many of you, I'll let Alana just wave back. Alana is the new Donna Russo, so to speak. And, uh, there's there's not, never going to be anyone who's exactly like Donna, uh, but Donna's since retired, and Alana Chilton is the genetic counselor who's taken over and um, filling Donna's shoes. Um, D Alana did a great job of putting together a couple of these slides for the group. So in particular, let me see if I can show you with the pointer. Uh, in terms of when things happen, um, we pulled this table to be able to show you on the left is the youngest age at which we know the manifestation has happened, and then on the right, the average age at which we know something has happened, and then being able to show you a lifetime of risk. And so some of these are ranges. They're based on multiple studies. Again, things like the hemangioblastomas are something that we see more frequently than not, and the screening recommendations that we've given you are based on these. And so knowing that they can happen in young people, children in other words, Words. They don't happen in little tiny toddlers in terms of this, but they can happen in young people, and that's why we've made the adjustments in terms of when we start to do the screening. Uh, we also try and think in, and keep in mind when individuals are ready for being able to do screening, so when they'll be able to sit still in a scanner, not need to have sedation, for instance, for scanning, and that's why we've made the recommendations that we've had. But I just wanted you all to have this as a reference for things. Uh, as Dr. Chabot was saying in terms of, for instance, pancreas cysts, pancreas cysts are relatively, uh, we can see them if we look hard enough in terms of having peanuts, um, you know, less frequently that we'll actually see those. So putting all the pieces together, um, Hopefully that gives you a holistic view. Um, you've heard several people talk about cells growing and cancer cells and how this happens. Uh, in individuals with von Hippel-Lindau syndrome, they're born with two copies of the VHL gene. We all are. Um, in this particular case, they have one copy that's working perfectly fine and another copy that has a, a tiny typo, a tiny genetic change. Uh, and over time, what oftentimes happens for all of us with cancer is that there's actually a change to the second copy of the gene that keeps it from protecting your body against against some of those cells that are overgrowing. Uh, and that's why as we're born, it's not as if we're born with these hemangioblastomas or born with these pancreas cysts, but there's something that happened over the course of a lifetime. Um, for certain individuals, uh, if we could figure out some way of being able to keep this copy of the gene healthy for an entire lifetime of 70, 80 years, that would be amazing. And so there are researchers actually thinking about how are the ways of being able to protect the good copy from working even longer. And we don't have an answer to it yet, uh, but it is something what, that we think about. Um, as I said, this is a condition that's inherited, so it can be passed down. Uh, if you look around the room and if we had people raise hands, you'd see that on average it's about 50% male, about 50% female. So it's equal opportunity in terms of that. We see it from people around the world, so it's not as if it's in, you know only that we see it from individuals of Norwegian ancestry. We see it in individuals of Japanese, Chinese, uh, South African, Brazilian, American, every ancestry you can think of we've seen for VHL. Um, as we see it, again, for these two copies of the gene, when we go to have children, we all pass down one copy of each gene. And it's a random chance. It's like flipping a coin. Which one of the two copies of the VHL gene get passed down in the family? It can be passed down to a boy or a girl, but it's basically 50-50 in terms of doing this. 
Um, I'll get back to that idea in a second. Um, not everyone with VHL, though, has a family history of the condition. And I haven't done a survey. I've done a mental survey, but I haven't counted all, the, all of you guys up. Uh, most people that are in the room here today, it has been something we've seen in the family. So we've seen it. And for some of you, you've got brothers or sisters that have this, children, parents that have this. Uh, but there are individuals, on average, probably a little less than 10%, where you're the first person in your family with VHL. This is what we call a spontaneous or a new change or a de novo change, um, even though it might have been new in you when you go on to have children, it's still that 50-50 chance of passing it down. Um, because of this, and a couple of the speakers have mentioned it this morning, we as doctors take a careful family history when you come in with your first manifestation of VHL, be it a hemangioblastoma, uh, uh, could be a pheochromocytoma. Um, we test for it, VHL, frequently more as a rule out um, to make sure that that person doesn't have other manifestations down the road. Uh, but by virtue of the fact that you're here today, everyone here actually has a bona fide VHL diagnosis, so you're past that point. So the question becomes, in some cases, um, how do I understand my genetic results? And I'm going to give you probably a deeper dive on something. For many of you, I know it's been many, many years since you've had your VHL testing. I'll try and give you an update in terms of what we know about the genetic information. Um, with this, uh, again, for all of you, having the diagnosis helped us to know that you need to be in this club and that you need to follow these screening recommendations. And I'll get back to this a little bit. Uh, it also helps us to know in terms of other family members, once we have a specific mutation for VHL identified, any other family members only needed to be tested for that specific genetic mutation. Uh, we call it targeted testing. And if they do not have that specific genetic mutation that is known in that family, they are off the hook. The likelihood that they have VHL due to something else is so infinitesimally small that I don't even worry about it. And so it's something very easy to do. For some of you, we've done it on your children, even from the time they were born, basically, you know, from uh, almost a few days of birth. Um, so with that, it helps us in terms of knowing about for that, that for the future. Then I'll get back to some options also in terms of family planning. Um, as we think about this, uh, the genetic testing is extremely good. I won't go into all the details, but uh, for someone who has real manifestations of VHL, it's extremely good. In our entire Columbia series of well over 100 patients, we do have one family in which the genetic testing has failed us. So I can't say genetic testing is perfect. Um, and there are ways that we're trying to figure out how to be able to see things that might have been missed out of traditional testing. But VHL is pretty characteristic. Um, that if you really do have the hemangioblastomas, for instance, and the pheochromocytomas or some of the retinal findings, we're pretty sure it's VHL. And for you, we go ahead and we follow our regular screening recommendations. Um, so with this, this is just a pictorial uh, portion of the gene. Um, we had mentioned actually these different exons. They're different pieces or chunks that the genes come into. I'm showing just in terms of the stick figure where different changes are located. Uh, and you heard a little bit already um, with VHL type 1 or type 2. Um, we have slightly different frequencies of some of those manifestations depending on exactly what the genetic mutation is. Uh, I will say I personally have managed all of you all as being relatively conservative in terms of screening for all of the different manifestations. Uh, because it, the screening is really quite easy to do and it's really better to be safe than sorry in terms of some of the renal or pheochromocytoma manifestations. But if you go back to your genetic testing and have any questions about that, Alana or I will be happy to guide you through in terms of what it means. Um, with this, I've divided this down. No one here has types 2C, so no one that's, that got a ticket to come to this event uh, actually has just the pheochromocytoma, although we do have other patients um, with that that are not here today. Uh, really, everyone who's here in this room has either type 1 or type 2A or 2B. And the real manifestations or the true differences are individuals that have the type 1 and the mutations that are in that region have a lower risk of pheochromocytoma, whereas individuals who have the type 2A mutation have a lower risk either for the renal cell carcinoma or the pancreatic tumors. And again, I'm not going to talk about 2C today. Um, with this, as I said, the, uh, we've tended to be conservative in the sense of making sure we covered everyone for everything uh, because there are a fair number of individuals that we've seen within the family, one or more of the manifestations. Um, again, trying to show you this pictorially, um, these are just the different uh, type 1. Really what you're seeing is we 
Alana uh, found, I thought this was a good picture to be able to show it pictorially, all the different parts of the body in terms of the eyes and the brains, um, the adrenals, the kidneys, being able to see all these manifestations. There may be some difference by the exact type of mutation and how sort of strong the mutation is. This is work that we're really doing much more on the research basis, but to see um, that in the coming time, we may have better estimates in terms of being more precise about our screening or our concerns about different manifestations. Um, at this point, it's not quite that precise, but there are a few mutations specifically, and if anyone in the group goes back and looks at their genetic testing reports, I am going to call out there are a few of these mutations shown here that we have a little bit more evidence, a little bit more data, and so I think it's more reliable in terms of trying to make some um, extrapolations about what to do. So in terms of the genetic testing, just to remind people, this is really, as my son says, easy peasy, lemon squeezy. Um, so with this, um, it's covered by insurance. It's not expensive. We've gotten it even as a community that we can do it on saliva samples. Um, so any of the children that are worried about needles or getting stuck, uh, we've got a way of being able to do this. And our turnaround times are our time to get the answer, usually less than a month and oftentimes even a couple weeks. And so uh, from my point of view, if there's anyone that needs testing, there's no reason not to do the testing. Testing. It's simply a matter of, uh, as I said, Alana or I are help, happy to help you through that. Um, one of the things that some folks do ask me, not for individuals who already have clinical symptoms of VHL, uh, but they're thinking about, in particular, the next generation or other family members who are asymptomatic. Some people ask me, well, is there any way this could come back to bite me if I get genetic testing? Could I be discriminated against in any way? Uh, and I just want to reassure people, I, I know the group here knows it, uh, but there are federal laws in place, something called the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, so a federal law that we pass to be able to protect individuals against genetic predispositions, so anyone that has genetic information, um, you should not, number one, have your insurance denied, you should not have your insurance taken away from you, you should not have your rates raised because of that information, um, you are protected against that. And so if anyone has any problem, please let me know. I've got a whole bunch of Columbia Law School lawyers who are ready to take these people to court if they try and touch you, um, but there should not be any problems with that. The problem that we have, and I should also say that applies to employment. So for your employer, there's no, you shouldn't be fired, you shouldn't be denied a promotion or anything because of that. There are some gaps in the law, I want to be honest. Um, I wish Congress had passed the version that we tried to get them to pass, but they didn't. Uh, and so the gaps in this are gaps in terms of disability insurance or, or long-term life, in, life insurance. Um, if you get this through your job, sort of a standard package, I haven't seen any patients who've had any trouble with that. Um, but for individuals, if you get it before you do your genetic testing, uh, if you get that life insurance plan, it's fine. Just keep paying your premiums. Um, and so I have seen some patients who have done the sequencing of getting your insurance plan in place and then do your genetic testing, um, and that way you've got things covered. Again, um, it hasn't been a big issue that I've seen, but for full disclosure, I just wanted you to know. Um, I will say, and I think many of you know this because you've got many people in the family, there are all sorts of emotions that come with this. And um, some of you may or may not have appreciated, but it's emotions that come if you test positive or sometimes even if you test negative. Uh, I certainly had families who've come to me and said, I felt guilty that actually I didn't have this. I wasn't like other people in my family. And what I tell them is, you've got a special job in your family too. Um, you know, all of us in terms of families, hopefully functional families, pitch in uh, when a family member needs some help. And so some people who don't have to worry about this as much. Um, they're oftentimes extremely helpful in terms of being able to pitch in. Um, but I will say that this is something just to be aware of and cognizant of, and especially for those of you who are parents and have children, um, remember, take care of your child. Don't care to take care of their gene. Uh, don't see their gene as you're uh, raising them and thinking about what their future is. Um, their gene is something we'll take care of in the background to support them to achieve wonderful, amazing things, uh, but don't worry about that. Just, just let their children grow up. Um, as we do this, uh, this is one of these conditions we do test children for, and some of you know we've tested even your teeny tiny children for, because it is something that can have medical consequences for them, even at an early age. Um, but as we do this, uh, I'm proud to see some of our young people even here today have grown up as wonderfully strong, bright, intelligent, independent-minded people who are happy, healthy, and uh, completely well-adjusted to this. So it, it happens all the time. 
Um, for some of you, and I realize some of you just looking out at the group, this doesn't apply to you, and that's okay. You can take a nap for 30 seconds. Um, but for some of you, uh, other family members may be thinking about having kids, and I just wanted to review some of the technologies that are available. Um, I wish it were covered by insurance universally. Maybe someday we'll get there. Um, but there are ways, if you're really concerned about passing this down to the next generation, to be able to avoid that circumstance. We also have plenty of people who aren't worried about that, and uh, their children are doing perfectly fine. Um, one of the ways that we have of doing it, uh, some people get worried about an abortion, um, and I completely understand that. Um, that's something that if we do something like an amniocentesis or a chorionic villa sampling, uh, if you were to find out something about the VHL status that you weren't happy with, an abortion may not be what you want to do. I, I totally get that. So because of that, we've developed a new technology called pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. Uh, this requires going through in vitro fertilization. So this is where we make a test tube baby, so to speak. Um, uh, so we dim the lights in the lab, we take eggs from the woman, we take a sperm sample from the man, uh, dim the lights in the lab, play some romantic music, and uh, create a baby. Um, and as we do that, what we do is we very gently, very carefully take a few cells from the embryo before it's in the woman and test for the VHL to figure out which of the embryos is going to potentially develop VHL and those not, and transfer only the embryos that don't have VHL. Um, Really, I think it's almost all religious groups, uh, clergy that I've worked with have blessed this, literally blessed this in terms of something that is in line with their belief system. Um, if there's anyone that you know for any particular ethical reasons that would have issues, I'm glad to talk with them about this, but this has been almost universally accepted in terms of that. Um, where it hasn't been accepted so much, I'll warn you, is from insurance companies. I wish it had been uh, because I think this is something that families should be able to have access to, and so if this is something that's of concern to you, come and speak with Alana or myself.